الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Our brother Zainul Abidin, chairman of the Masjid Board, respected Imam, brothers and sisters here at Masjid Al Mu'minun, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us the Quran. And if we do not turn to the Qur'an, for what the Qur'an has come to give to us, we'll have to answer for that. It is not the New Straits Times, not the evening television that provides us with guidance, but the Qur'an. And nobody will defer with that. In Surah Al-Nahl of the Qur'an, Allah speaks about the functions of the Qur'an. And He says, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ صدق الله العظيم Surah An-Nahl, Surah number 16. And we sent down the Quran, the cook, on thee, O Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, in order that this Quran might explain all things. that this Qur'an might explain all things. And therefore, this Qur'an must explain the reality of this strange and mysterious world in which we are living today. And if we do not go to the Qur'an to search for that explanation, then we'll have to answer for that uh, betrayal of the Qur'an. And this Qur'an has come down with guidance. It not only explains, it guides. And it has come down as rahmah, mercy. And for those who turn to the Qur'an, And for those who turn to the Qur'an, that the Qur'an might explain all things, Bushra lahum, good news and glad tidings for such people. They will understand what others cannot. And they will succeed when others will not. In religion, we do not believe that history will continue eternally, not in religion. <laughs> we believe that there was a beginning and there will be an end. And when the end takes place, then we'll all have to face judgment. This is religious belief. But Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam told us that before the end comes, there will be a last age of great tests and trials. 
you will see very strange things in that last age. And when you see them, you must know that this is Akhiru Zaman. For example, that you will find the naked, barefooted shepherds competing with each other, sometimes in Jiddah, sometimes in Dubai, sometimes in Seoul, and sometimes you know where, yeah? to build the tallest buildings, the tallest buildings of all. And when you see that, of course, you know that this is Akhir zaman But you also know something else, that the dunya is attempting to brainwash you into believing that tall buildings are a symbol of progress. And since Kampung don't have any tall buildings, it's time to get out of Kampung <laughs> and come to the city where there are tall buildings and shopping malls and highways and byways. And when a teenager from Kampung comes into the shopping mall, he says, this is Jannah. <laughs> <laughs> he said about Akhir zaman that women would be dressed and would yet be naked. So when you see the parade of flesh, and of course it is in the city, not Kampo. So if you want to see and enjoy the naked woman, you gotta leave Kampung, come to the city. Around the world today, women in so many places are dressed and yet naked. May Allah bless the women of Islam who still hold on to the hijab and who cover themselves. May Allah bless them and build for them houses in Jannah. He said that women would dress like men. So not only is the nakedness going to lead to a sexual revolution, which of course involves zina, and you know the price of zina, don't you? The price of zina is once you put your step down that road, no more noor, no more noor in the heart, no more noor in the heart. But women would be dressed like men indicating that in Akhir zaman women will seek to assume the functional role of men in society and the price that they would pay is terrible because long time Masha Allah, your mother had 12 children and growing up, 12 children, it was so joyous, so enjoyable. And when the family came together, it was so wonderful to have so many children and grandchildren and so on. But now, no more, because she is a working woman. So now only 
one child or maybe two children. And now the bonding that used to take place is no longer there. And so shaitan can come and pick them away. And this one becomes a drug addict. And that one becomes a homosexual. And family is no longer there to call you back. So she assumes a functional role of men in society with significant implications for the economy, but even more dangerous implications for the home. Are all these things happening by accident? Oh, I forgot. Your prophet and mine, he said that men would dress like women. And when we ask the question, why would a man dress like a woman? The answer should be obvious. The man is dressing like a woman to attract another man. And so in Akhil Zaman, there's going to be homosexuality. And those who control power in the world and who control money in the world and who can take your ringette and do what they want with it anytime they want. They will insist upon you enacting legislation all around the world, permitting a man to marry another man. And then you must get a marriage certificate. That's the most dangerous one of all. Because in the Quran, Allah destroyed those two cities of homosexuality, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he left that punishment as a sign. He did it once and he can do it again. And you would be astonished about what the Quran says about Akhiru Zaman and how many are going to be destroyed. You won't believe it. In Surah to Bani Israel, which is also known as Surah Al Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa immin qariyatin illa نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُوهَا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَسْتُورًا All towns and cities are going to be destroyed. And the major cause for destruction would be the marriage certificate. <laughs> And those which are not destroyed are going to be punished with great punishment. This is a matter which is inscribed in the Kitab. So it is going to come to pass. There is great destruction in Akhiru Zaman. If you continue to live in a society in which the law permits a man to marry another man, then you deserve the destruction that awaits you and your family. So if you are resident in Canada, or resident in the United States, or resident in Britain, or in France, the writing is on the wall. There are many strange things happening in the world today. The disappearance of a Malaysian aircraft is just the latest. But on the scale of what is most strange of all, and for which the human mind and the human heart cries for an explanation, is that Allah speaks in the Quran about a holy land. Al Ardul Muqaddasa. And he says in the Quran that he gave that land 
to Banu Israel. Yes, he does. The land was given to Banu Israel. But there are two ways of studying the Quran. One is the wrong way and the other is the right way. The wrong way is when you take a verse in isolation to derive meaning because you can make a, make a mistake. The right way is to go to all the verses of the Quran on that particular subject. And when we do that, we find that Allah did not give the land to them unconditionally. No. He gave the land to them conditionally. What were the conditions? That you have to have faith in Allah and your conduct must be righteous. Then you qualify to inherit the Holy Land. And the Jews will themselves tell you, you don't have to take it from me, they will tell you, that every time we violated the covenant, Allah threw us out. The first time was when Musa alayhi salam told them, come on, let us go and fight and take control of the Holy Land, which Allah gave to you. And they said, no. There are very powerful people living in that land. You and your Lord, both of you go and fight. We're staying right here. Allah gave the land to them. And then what did Allah do? He threw them out. For how long? For how long? Forty years. They were wandering in Sinai <laughs> for 40 years. And then again, when they took control of the Holy Land, and Nabi Dawood established the Holy State of Israel, and Nabi Sulaiman built the Masjid, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Then after that, they engaged in fasad. لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ and Allah threw them out. And they were taken as slaves to Babylon. Hmm? So the evidence is clear that the land was not given to them unconditionally. It was given to them conditionally. But the last time when they killed the prophets of Allah, Zakaria alayhi salam, and then they boasted of how they killed Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Inna qatalna al-Masiha Isa ibn Maryam Rasul. Rasul Allah. This time Allah threw them out of the land. And then he prohibited their return. They can come back as tourists. That's okay. But you can never return to reclaim this land as your own. Not only did he ban their return, but in addition to that, he broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. So Jews in Argentina and Jews in Chile and Jews in Venezuela. Venezuela is just next door to my island of Trinidad. Hmm? And Jews in China and Jews in Russia and Jews in Yemen, all over the place. But something strange has happened. And this is the strangest one of all in the modern age. The 2,000 years after Allah expelled them, and prohibited their return. They are back in the Holy Land. And they have reclaimed the Holy Land as their own. Surely this cries for an explanation. <coughs> and the question we ask tonight at Masjid al Mukminun to those who still have love in their hearts for the Quran. 
to those who still find a little time to go into the Qur'an, to study it, to these people. The question that we ask tonight here at Masjid al-Mu'minun, what is the explanation in the Qur'an for this dramatic and mysterious return of the Jews to the Holy Land, to reclaim it as their own, 2,000 years after Allah expelled them. Your newspapers will never explain that. The television stations will never touch that subject. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't bother about that. But even stranger than that, Holy Israel, established by Nabi Dawood was also destroyed. And now, 2,000 years later, a state of Israel has been restored in the Holy Land. And so if we do not ask, what's going on here? I want to understand. And I want the Quran to explain to me what's going on here. If we don't do that, we're just like cattle. A people who have eyes and yet do not see. They have ears and yet do not hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. Ula'ika kalanam, be just like cattle. Life is to go to work and come back home and have nasi biryani and watch television and go to sleep. Day after day after day. Not only has the state of Israel been restored in the Holy Land, but more than that, at the time when Israel was restored, a little island off the coast of Europe never walked on the stage of history. Napoleon Bonaparte contemptuously dismissed Britain as a nation of shopkeepers. <laughs> and this little island off the coast of Europe becomes a ruling state in the world, taking control of every single strategically important naval port in the whole world. And it is Britain who plays the most crucial role of all in the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and in the restoration of the state of Israel. And then came a dramatic transfer of power from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana. And now America is the ruling power in the world. And uh, the United States of America continues this mysterious relationship with Israel, providing the baby with everything that the baby needs, not only to survive, but to grow up strong and healthy. Massive, massive economic aid, massive military aid, massive transfer of military technology and endless vetoes in the Security Council of the United Nations to protect Israel. And so over a period of 60 years or more, this baby Israel grows to become so powerful today that no politician, none, in the United States of America dares to criticize Israel. You finished. Israel controls the U.S. Congress <laughs> and the United States is a ruling state in the world. So how do we explain the return of the Jews to the Holy Land 2,000 years after they were expelled and their return is prohibited? The restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land 
2,000 years after Allah destroyed it. And the growth of Israel to a status now akin to ruling state in the world. Is there anything in the Quran which explains this? We now turn to Surah Al Anbiya of the Quran. And remember, <coughs> wrong methodology and right methodology. <laughs> right methodology is you don't take a verse in isolation. You take all the data in the Quran pertaining to that subject. Hmm? In Surah Al Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a town. The Arabic word is Qarya. And he says, Waharamun ala Qaryatin ahlaknaha annahum la yarji'un. It is now prohibited for a town meaning the people of the town, Ahlul Qarya. A town which was destroyed and the people were expelled. That they are now prohibited that they can never return to that town to reclaim it as their own. This was verse 95, I believe. 94, 95. The next verse takes us straight to Akhiru Zaman. <laughs> the next verse says, Hatta, oh, they will be able to return to that town. But when? Hatta, Ida Futihat, Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, Futihat. Futihat means release. And Ba'atha means to send. Futihat means release. And Ba'atha means send. So the Quran is saying when Gog and Magog are released, Wahum min kulli hadabin yan silud. And after they release, they spread out in all directions. And uh, Hadith al-Qudsi in Sahih Muslim, and Allah says about Gog and Magog, I have created creatures of mine, and Gog and Magog are human beings, human beings, so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So when Gog and Magog are released into the world, with their indestructible power, only Allah can destroy them. They will take control of power in the world. Every other civilization will have to move aside. And a new actor will come on the stage of the world. And that new actor will take control of the whole world. And that would be the world order of Gog and Magog. So when Gog and Magog are released, and when they spread out in all directions, taking control of the world, at that time you will see these people being brought back to this town to reclaim it as their own. Which town is it? It has to be a town connected with Akhiru Zaman. Can't be Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> Why? Because Gog and Magog are actors located in Akhiru Zaman. Proper methodology. Is there any town which is connected with Gog and Magog? There are about 40 to 50 ahadith on Gog and Magog. 
But only one town is ever mentioned, only one, and you guessed it, it's Jerusalem. <coughs> Using the methodology of searching for a town which has a central role in Akhir Zaman, we came to the conclusion that Allah is speaking about Jerusalem. And so the Quran is saying that Allah destroyed Jerusalem, expelled the Jews, banned their returns until Gog and Magog are released and they spread out in all directions. So now we have a very important revelation. Oh yes. The Jews are back in the Holy Land and the Quran is telling us how they came back <laughs> and the Quran is telling us who brought them back and the Quran is telling us what is the implication of their return. It is Gog and Magog who returned them, who brought them back. But unfortunately, I have been teaching the subject of Gog and Magog for 20 years now from New York where I used to be, around the world. And mine has been a voice crying, <laughs> crying in the wilderness. Yes. I can't get the world of Islamic scholarship, I can't get them to come and take up the subject of Gog and Magog. Yes. I have a book outside, An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. We don't have the time to take up the subject, so you can read that book. But the major work is entitled <coughs> Jerusalem in the Quran. Some of you may have already read that book. We have that book in Bahasa now. <coughs> Unfortunately, we didn't bring it tonight. So you can get it in English. But if you come tomorrow night to my lecture, Jalal, you know where it is tomorrow night? Huh? Third space. Third space. In Pantai Dalam. In Pantai Dalam. Third space in Pantai Dalam. Here's Jalal, he'll let you know where it is. Uh, you can get the Bahasa book tomorrow night. And so now we are faced with a calamitous situation that Gog and Magog cannot be destroyed. No. But Gog and Magog have PhDs in committing facade. Everything they touch, they spoil it, they corrupt it, they destroy it. Everything. And so when we look today at the world of money, and very few people are prepared to do that. <laughs> huh? For 1400 years, my gosh, this Ummah used dinar and dirham. For 1400 years, we used dinar and dirham. Dinar and dirham are in the Quran. Dinar and dirham are in the Sunnah of the Prophet. Gog and Magog took dinar and dirham out of the market. prohibited the use of dinar and dirham as money. It is there in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. And then replaced the dinar and dirham with bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper, plastic and now electronic money in order to perpetrate facade. With the use of this money, which you, you'd be surprised, eh? You just take a piece of paper and you put a picture on it and you put a number on it and before you start laughing at me, remember I've studied international monetary economics in two universities, okay? 
and then you say abracadabra and it becomes money. Yeah. But when we do the same thing, our money can't do anything with it. We take one big basket full of Bangladeshi taka to Midtown Manhattan. You can't even buy a cup of coffee. No. But you take one US dollar and you can go to any kampung in Indonesia and they have a ready market for it. Hmm? Because of this money, you could have the banking system, <laughs> which is the sister of the monetary system. And because of these two, you know what's a vacuum cleaner? It sucks the dust. Well, while you and I were drinking Te Tariq and eating Roti Chanai, the vacuum cleaner has been at work, sucking the wealth of, mass of mankind. Sucking the wealth of mankind. You could, have, you could actually hear the vacuum. All the wealth of mankind going to the Zionists. And day by day, the mass is growing poorer and poorer. It's not that they want to be rich. Oh, no. John Perkins, in a book I would recommend that you read, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He explained in that book, with great truth and integrity and courage, he says sometimes the money lender lends you money on interest, not because he wants to rip you off, but because he wants to enslave you. And so the vacuum is operating to bring slavery to mankind in Akhir zaman Is there slavery in Akhir zaman Yes, there is. When the angel asked the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, what are the alamat al-sa'a, the signs of the last day? He gave two. He said that you'll find the naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other and constructing high-rise buildings. But then he also said that a slave woman would give birth to her mistress, indicating the day of slavery in Akhir zaman So Gog and Magog are subjects that need to be carefully studied because they're not just corrupting the economy, not just corrupting the system of money, corrupting the political system. Corrupting agriculture, corrupting information, corrupting the male-female relationship, the sexual life. And you can name this long list where Gog and Magog are at work with facade. But Gog and Magog do not operate in isolation. No. They perform the job here on earth for a mastermind <coughs> who is controlling them. Why have they brought the Jews back to the Holy Land? Why have they restored the state of Israel in the Holy Land? Why is that Israel so powerful now? About to take over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world. Why? We want an answer. And the answer is given by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasalam. that when they 
boasted of how they killed him, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And they saw him die before their very eyes. They were now convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt he could not have been the Messiah. Why? Oh, he's dead. He never ruled the world. The golden age never came back for Banu Israel. The age of Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. But when, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a promise that he would send one who would be known as the Messiah and who would do precisely this, he would rule the world from Holy Jerusalem. The implication is that he, he was not the Messiah, so the Messiah is still to come. What they did not know and you and I never knew for 600 years until Allah sent the Quran was it no they did not kill him no they did not crucify him Allah made it appear like that Allah raised him and one day he's coming back even the security council of the United Nations cannot prevent that he's coming back The most important event now remaining to occur in history is the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And if you study Islamic eschatology, it is possible for you to have an average framework of how many years, how much time there is remaining. It is certainly not a hundred years, much less than that. When the sometimes when you are very tired, the mind just goes blank. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very tired, but I pray to Allah to give me the strength to deliver this talk. Yeah. Not only are they wrong when they say that they killed him? No. Allah, they did not kill him. Allah raised him and he will come back. But Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that before he comes back, Allah is going to release into the world someone who is going to seek to impersonate the true Messiah. Now, what is the bahasa for impersonate? Minyama. Minyama. Impersonate. Minyama. Allah is going to create someone and program him to impersonate. Minyama. Huh? All right, never mind. <laughs> And he will be Dajjal. <coughs> we do not have the time tonight and the little time which remains to give you an exhaustive summary on the subject of Dajjal. But if you read my book, Jerusalem and the Quran, that is enough for you. In order for Dajjal to successfully impersonate the Messiah, he will have to do a number of things. Number one, the Holy Land is under the control of Muslims. So he'll have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He did that in 1917. Number two, he'll have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He did that already. Number three, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is holy Israel. He's done that already. But number four, he'll have to cause this Israel to become the ruling state in the world. 
So in stage one he had Pax Britannica, a day like a year, and in stage two he had Pax Americana, a day like a month, and in stage three he'll have Pax Judaica, a day like a week. And at that time, Israel will lay claim to be the ruling state in the world. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, then a man would be born. He has to be born of human parents, must be born. Why? Because no Jew is going to accept you as the Messiah unless they can trace your pedigree that you are from the royal house of Dawood al-Islam. <laughs> so who was your father? Who was your mother? Who was your grandfather? Who was your, huh? So he has to be born of human parents. The Jal. The Prophet said al-Islam to Islam that he would be a young man. He'd be a Jew. A young man, powerfully built, with curly hair. And from Jerusalem, he would declare, I am the Messiah. How soon are we from that? Well, after all, Israel has already been restored. Israel is already close to being the ruling state in the world. How long are we from that? If you study Islamic eschatology, Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, it is a fascinating subject. And I urge you to take some time and study it. The hadith is in the Sunnah of Abi Dawood. And the Prophet gave us a timeline. This will come first, and then this will come, and then that will come, and then that will come, and then that will come. Huh? Timeline. He said, Umran ubaytil maqdis. That when Jerusalem is flourishing, center stage, built up, at that time, Medina will be a forgotten city <laughs> in forlorn desolation, playing absolutely no role whatsoever in the affairs of the world, the affairs of the world of Islam, the affairs of the Arabian Peninsula, nothing. We're already there now. When you see these two things in place, then the next thing that's going to take place would be the Malhama, or what the Christians call Armageddon. And you can see that they're circling Russia now. They're circling Russia. Russia just gave them a beating the first that they ever got since the Zionist movement was created. The Zionist movement never suffered a loss the likes of what they suffered over the last one week or two weeks in Crimea. So they're planning and plotting for Russia. But Russia is not going to back down. No. So you're moving now to head-on collision. It's just a matter of time. When that head-on collision takes place between the two superpowers, the NATO alliance and the Russian alliance, they're going to use nuclear weapons. That's the Malhama. And when you use nuclear weapons, that's going to be such a war that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, that birds flying in the sky will fall down. Why would a bird fall down? Answer, because the bird can no longer navigate. The same way the bees can no longer navigate now. So honey production is going down around the world. Because of the electronic waves. So once that malhama takes place, my opinion, and I can be wrong, is that you will no longer be able to wage electronic warfare. 
Nothing will fly in the sky after that, nothing. So after the Malhama, wars will be fought on the land and on the sea. He continued to say, Khurujul Malhama, Fathul Constantinia. That when the Malhama takes place, that will lead to the conquest of Constantinople. Since my prophet referred to the city as Constantinople, it is a sunnah to refer to the city as Constantinople. So Mustafa Kemal can do whatever he wants to do. He cannot prevent me, no, from using the name Constantinople. In Turkey, you are banned today. You could be arrested. I wonder why. <laughs> because they want you to believe that the conquest of Constantinople already took place a, hundred, a few hundred years ago with a sultan named Muhammad Fatih. And they have exalted him and raised him to a status very high. That this is the man that Nabi Muhammad prays. You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. And he prays the commander in chief. And he prays the army. So Mustafa Kamal and the Turkish people would want me to believe in this nonsense, utter nonsense, that the conquest of Constantinople, prophesied by Nabi Muhammad wasalam, took place a few hundred years ago, in the year 1453. Wrong. The conquest of Constantinople, Mustafa Kemal, comes after the Malhama. And the Malhama has not taken place as yet. Where is your sense? It is only after the conquest of Constantinople that the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, Fathul Constantinia, Khurujul Dajjal. Only after the conquest of Constantinople would Dajjal now appear in human form. How much time do we have left for the Malhama? I don't know, but it's not going to be long. There's a straight line between Crimea and Constantinople. There's a black sea in between. Straight line. And uh, give me a few minutes for this. Dajjal began his planning <laughs> against Russia in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. Russia was the most Christian of all European countries. And he brought, through Russian Jews, a revolution which brought atheism, communism, and the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union then proceeded to persecute the Christian church, closing down monasteries, closing down churches, killing priests, and they did it for 20, 70 years in order to destroy what the Quran refers to as room, Surah to room. Then in 1954, the Soviet Union did something mysterious without any rhyme or reason, without seeking the consent of the people, without consulting with the people, the Soviet Union took a piece of the property of Russia and gave it to Ukraine, <laughs> the peninsula of Crimea. Why did the Soviet Union do that? It is connected with Israel. That's why Israel was born just six years earlier. And the master plan is to deny Russia Crimea. 
Then came the 1980s, when they used the same methodology of demonstrations on the street, like you now have in Venezuela, and you had in Ukraine for a few months. Hmm? And using this, they brought down the Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapsed like a house of cards. <laughs> Who did it? The Zionists did it. Why did they do it? Because they wanted Ukraine to emerge as an independent state. When Ukraine emerges as an independent state, then the next step is to have a government in Ukraine which will be anti-Russia and pro-West. And they got that three weeks ago when the president had to flee and they took over the country. Now all that remained is for the new government in Ukraine to take Ukraine into NATO. And who can stop it? <laughs> and once Ukraine is a member of NATO, now NATO is going to protect Ukraine, then the government in Ukraine will give Russia marching orders, take your black fleet out of our territory. The Russian black fleet has been stationed in Crimea for the last two, three hundred years. <laughs> but they're there now since 1954 on the basis of an agreement, a lease. And once the Ukrainian government gives the Russians marching orders, the news will now be around the neck of Russia. Russia is no longer a naval power. <laughs> no, that's it, finish. But Allah is lillahi al-am. He says in Surah to Surah to Rum, he says, Lillahi al-Amr, min qabl wa min ba'd, wa yawma izin yafrahu al-mu'minun. Putin was able to act so swiftly, they didn't know what hit them. And within a matter of two weeks, it was over. And Crimea is now returned to Russia. And that spells danger for Israel. Why? Because now the plan which has been in force step by step since 1917, that plan has been thwarted. And Russia is now a more formidable naval power. The Prophet also said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam about the conquest of Constantinople that we will make an alliance with Rome. But we will make an alliance with Rome. And so a Muslim alliance with Russia is going to come into being whether the people approve of it or they don't. It doesn't matter. You know, it's going to come into being. Because both Russia and the world of Islam that is faithful to Allah and His Messenger are in opposition to the Zionists. And so we can now see that the conquest of Constantinople, which is coming, will be on the basis of a joint attack. That the Muslim army will attack on the land and the, Soviet, the Russian navy will attack from, from Crimea on the sea. And when NATO loses Constantinople, the back of NATO is broken. Hmm? The next step will be the Khuruj of Dajjal. Now, before we end, let's go to another timeline. This is a hadith. There's another timeline. And this timeline tells us more than that one of the Sunan of Abi Dawood. It is not by accident that the greatest amount of space in the Quran devoted to any Nabi is devoted to Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Far and away the most is Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Why? Because it has implications for Akhiru Zaman, that's why. What happened was there was an epic encounter between Fir'aun 
who was all powerful, who was godless, who was wicked, who was an oppressor. And the Muslims who were Banu Israel with Musa al Islam and who had no tanks and no weapons, who were weak, but who had faith in Allah and were they oppressed. And in that struggle between oppressor and oppressed, Allah sent to the oppressor sign after sign as a warning. How many? Nine. Nine. Until eventually, at the last moment, Allah parted the sea and Banu Israel were able to cross and when Fir'aun and his army attempted to cross, they were destroyed. That's how it ended the first time. Is this going to be repeated in Akhir Zaman? Is there going to be a repetition of this epic encounter in Akhir Zaman? Yes. When Fir'aun was drowning, he realized that he wasn't God. And so he declared his faith in the God of Banu Israel underneath the water. Nobody knew about that, not even the New Straits Times, nobody knew about it. When he declared his faith, in the God of Banu Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then responded and said, and this ayah is in Surah 2, Yunus. Correct. Al-an, now, Fir'an, now, waqad asayta qabr, and before this you were in obstinate and arrogant rejection, waqunta min al-mufsideen, and you were corrupting and destroying the world, this day, we have determined to preserve your badan, your physical body. Your physical body cannot be destroyed. We will preserve it. Why? That your physical body, when it is recovered, would be a sign for a people to come after you. But most people are careless. They don't bother about my sign, says Allah. They're too busy. Afternoon traffic, morning traffic. <laughs> no time. The body of Fir'aun was discovered in 1898. And the events which have occurred since 19 since that time, have followed in a pattern. We don't have the time to give you that pattern tonight, but it is fascinating for the student of history hmm? to see how events are unfolding. And they are going to continue to unfold until history repeats itself. The Quran says, we have preserved your body. That your body, when it is discovered, would be a sign for a people to come after you. What is the sign? Your brother Imran gives an opinion. And when he gives an opinion, the rule is never to accept his opinion. No, nope. never until you are convinced that it is correct. This is the respect I have for your rational faculty, for your intellect. Hmm? My opinion is that <laughs> the sign is that when the body of Fir'aun is discovered, history will now repeat itself. So if you want to understand the reality of the world today, go to the Quran and study the story of Musa alayhi salam. And you see the events unfolding one by one, which will culminate the same way. At that time, it was strike the water. 
At this time, it will be the son of Mary who will descend. I have taken you tonight on a tour of the Quran, going to several verses of the Quran, hoping that by Allah's leave, your appetite would be wetted. And you now go back home and pick up the Quran and study it. Yes, the Quran and the Hadith do explain the reality of the world today. And if we don't go to them to study what they explain, then we'll have to answer for that omission one day. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْعَ عَلَيْنَا يَا مُولَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ بِرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَرْحْمَ الرَّحِيمِينَ آمين Do we have time for questions? We have a few minutes. We take three questions. While you're framing your questions, my books are outside somewhere in the corridor. If you want them autographed, just bring them to me, inshallah, and I'll be happy to autograph them. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, in the Quran, it is not mentioned about Zainis, mentioned about Yahud. Uh, uh, so, why, why are we saying that uh, the Zainis are the, the enemy, but we cannot say okay. that? Okay. All right. This is another verse of the Quran that I did not quote. Proper methodology, remember. Allah speaks in the Quran in Surah Al Ma'idah. O oh, you who have faith in Allah, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. No, not possible. Tabuli. Why? Because there are several other verses of the Quran which would be in conflict with that. So the question now arises: Which Jews? And which Christians is he talking about? Don't take them as your friends and allies. The answer is located in the words which follow. Allah is speaking about such Jews and such Christians who themselves are friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Qur'an is anticipating a time which is to come when there will be a mysterious reconciliation between some Jews and some Christians and they will form an alliance, a Jewish-Christian alliance. When that happens, we Muslims are prohibited from being their friends and allies. And whosoever turns to them for friendship and alliance, you belong to them. You no longer belong to us. In Allah layahil kamazalimin. Surely Allah does not provide guidance to wicked people. How did that Jewish Christian alliance emerge? Answer: Zionist Jews, not all Jews are Zionists, not at all. And Zionist Christians, not all Christians are Zionists. Zionist Jews and Zionist Christians have brought that alliance into being. It is Zionism which is bonding to them as an alliance. So the Quran does direct our attention to Zionism in this verse of the Quran. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, this hadith saying that the slave women who gave birth to this verse, do you think there's anything with the mother Kabya? He's asking about the slave woman giving birth to her mistress, but that's going to take half an hour, so we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> yeah, any more questions? Yes, Mr. There is a claim that the Jews in Israel are not Israel, but they are Ethiopian Jews. That's right. That's right. That's right. Only a small percentage of Jews today are descended from Ibrahim alayhi salam, Banu Israel. The vast majority are not Semitic. <laughs> they are European. They converted to Judaism. And these are the Zionists. These are the Zionists.
the real Jews lived amongst us in Yemen, in Egypt, in Morocco. They lived amongst us for a thousand years in peace and in harmony. It is the Zionists who came and brought the state of Israel into being and forced them all to go leave Egypt and go to Israel, leave Yemen and go to Israel. Okay? And so the Zionist Jews are taking Banu Israel on a ride. The Zionist Jews are the Gog and Magog of the Quran. Yeah. One more question. One more. Yeah. Did you hear it? Huh? The Prophet said that in Akhirul Zaman that you Muslims will make an alliance with Rum. Who is Rum? To answer that question, you, go, you don't go to the New York Times. To answer that question, you go to the Quran. Yeah. Oh. It is, yeah. It is strange that the Sunni world of Islam is conspicuous in not reaching out to Russia. The Sunni world. I am one of the very few Sunni scholars to travel to Moscow myself and to meet with the scholars in Moscow. I did that last year and I'm going back again, inshallah, with my help permits it, to meet with the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is Rome. It is the Shia, they are the ones who have been forging close ties with Russia for a long time now. Don't blame me for that. <laughs> Don't blame me for that. Blame the Sunni scholars who are missing the boat. And that is our Prophet said that you will make an alliance with Rum. There's more to the Hadith than that, but I don't have the time tonight. The, the chairman told me up till 9.15, it's now 9.16. Okay? So if we have no more questions, no, no, time enough, yeah. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك ربنا وتعالى يا ذا الجلال والإكرام سمعنا وعطانا وفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وعلى أصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أمين